So, so how did it go? They bombed the French, but they're supposed to be bombing the Germans. Those are not the Germans. Huh? They also bombed the Indians and the Moroccans? Again, those are not the Germans. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, someone's in trouble. Yeah, yeah okay. March 18th, 1944. Japan has been playing pretty much only defense for close to two years now, having seized a pretty large empire by mid-1942. But Japan goes on the offensive this week. This week, the Japanese invade India. I'm Andy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, three Soviet fronts kicked off offensives in Ukraine, and all three took a bunch of new ground and pushed back the Axis. The Japanese began a new offensive from Burma aiming at India. They also made new attacks on Bougainville in the Solomons. Adolf Hitler issued his fortress order, and the Allies decided on another bombing effort to try and break the stalemate in Italy. Here's what follows. I'll jump right into Burma and India today. After the initial attacks last week, now on the 13th, 4th Corps Commander Jeffrey Schoons authorizes the withdrawal of 17th and 20th Indian Divisions to Impal. By the next day, 20th Indian is withdrawing in good order, but not so 17th. The Japanese have managed to set up four roadblocks on the route it has to take to Impal. On the 15th, the main effort of the Japanese attack begins as 15th and 31st divisions cross the Chindwin River around Homalin. Okay, the Japanese plan is to approach Empal from three directions. The 33rd division from the southwest along the Tikkim Road and Silchar Track. The southeast along the Tamu Pelel Road, which also features units of the 33rd. And then the 15th division from the north and northeast of Empal. That is the plan. They also have some 7,000 soldiers of Sopas Chandra Bose's Indian National Army in support. We saw last week that this began with the attacks from the southwest against David Cowan's 17th Indian Division. They were expecting an attack, but not until around the 15th, so it came a week early. Their plan had been to withdraw up the road when it came, but the Japanese have managed to get behind them and cut the Tidim Road. So the 17th will have to fight its way up. That starts around Tonzang and near the bridge on the Manipur River, which the 17th needs to cross. On the 16th, the British send in Hawker Hurricane fighter bombers to hit the enemy. On the 17th comes artillery bombardments and infantry attacks. And since the Japanese don't have any cover here, their positions are overcome and the 17th Division crosses the bridge. However, another obstacle looms, the supply depot between milestones 109 and 110. The Japanese have it as of today. They've cut the road again behind the 17th Division and they can sure use the supplies there. If you are wondering how they managed to get behind the British, the Japanese are moving in four columns around here. And the left one, which is mainly the 215th Regiment, crossed the hills south of Tidim and then headed north and around aiming at the depot. As for the attacks from the southeast, the Tamu Pelel Road is the main road between Burma and India. It is an all-weather route. And when it reaches India, it winds through hills that are called Shinam Saddle or Shinam Pass or Ridge. From there, it heads to Pelel at the southeast of the Impal Valley. From Pelel to Impal are three airfields, one of which is the all-weather Pelel airfield, which is a major target of the Japanese advance up here by what is called Yamamoto Force, an infantry group backed by both a tank and an artillery regiment that has more firepower than the other two legs of the Japanese advance. Douglas Gracie's 20th Indian Division defends this route at Tamu, the first village on the Burmese side of the border. Schoons orders Gracie to withdraw the 16th, though for the two days before that, Japanese spearheads have been attacking his forward units. But they pull back in good order the rest of the week. The Allies are thwarting Japanese attacks, though, this week in the Solomons. By the 12th, the Americans really have the upper hand on Bougainville. Japanese Muda and Magata units that attacked late last week lose all of the small gains they made this week. Though the Muda unit does hang on to the south knob of Hill 260 until today. Japanese commander Harukichi Hayakutaki plans a final attack with all remaining force for next week on the 23rd. 
As for other operations in that theater, on the 12th, the Joint Chiefs of Staff finally issue their orders for the next round. The proposed landings at Hollandia are to go off April 15th. An invasion of the Marianas is set for June 15th, and attacks on the Palau's September 15th. They will bypass Truk, and by October, what will be the 5th Fleet will be ready to support Southwest Pacific Area Commander Douglas MacArthur's invasion of Mindanao. They do not announce a decision on what will happen after that, but they do tell Pacific Ocean Area Commander Chester Nimitz to plan for invading Formosa and MacArthur for invading Luzon, both in February 1945. There are plenty of other Allied attacks going off right now, though, many of them in the Soviet Union. Georgi Zhukov's first Ukrainian front offensive that made such gains last week has some difficulties this week. German Army Group South Commander Erich von Manstein's forces managed to hold the line between Tarnopol and Proskurov thanks to the forces he started bringing in to shore it up last week. In fact, by the 15th, 4th and 1st Panzer armies have managed to get their flanks reconnected. And on the 16th, 4th Panzer announces it will only take them three more days to clear the railway line. Manstein tells them not to focus too much on that though, since the line is also cut further south. But if the center is holding, Zhukov is battering away at the flanks and pushes the Axis forces out of both Lutsk and Dubno the 16th. I mentioned last week the Fuhrer Directive that established fortress points, which must be defended to the last man, right? Well, Kovel, just to the northwest of Lutsk, is one such point. As Lutsk falls, the SS general in charge in Kovel reports in that he is surrounded and wants to get out while he can. Heinrich Himmler sends him the message, you were sent to Kovel to hold it. Do that. Manstein does send some relief that way, sending over the 131st Infantry Division and the SS Viking Division from Poland, where they have been recuperating. And they do not have any heavy weapons. There is an armored train that is to give them artillery support, but a direct hit on his ammunition car blows up the whole train. Stavka confirmed Marshal Zhukov's operational intention to sweep southward onto and over the Dniester. This deep lancing of the German front would cut off 1st Panzer and slice into the remaining communication between German forces in Poland and those in southern Russia. The prospect for this massive axe blow to split the entire German southern grouping into two one part pressed into Galicia and southern Poland, the other pushed into Moldavia and onto the Danube was vastly increased by Marshal Konyev's own mud offensive. That offensive by Ivan Konyev's second Ukrainian front is making ever more gains this week. 38th Army is rolling up the flank of 1st Panzer Army towards Vinitsa. The Russian infantry where about 40% so-called booty Ukrainians, recruits the army scooped up as they advanced across the occupied territory. Even so, the weight of their numbers was too much for the overstrained German divisions. I have never heard that term booty Ukrainians before, but Ziemke wrote that in the 1960s, so maybe it was more common then. Anyhow, on the 15th, they cut the odessa Zmerinka railway line and enter Yampol on the Dniester the 17th. Also this week, Rodion Malinovsky's 3rd Ukrainian front strikes south from Novi Bug. Karl Adolf Hollit, commanding German 6th Army, is trying to get his army behind the river Bug as fast as he can. Malinovsky makes it a little easier for Hollit by sending his armor and cavalry south towards Nikolaev, but sending all his infantry west north of Nova Odessa. Sixth Army is not strong enough to stop either of these advances. The split allows it to escape for the time being. As for the fighting in the far north, where things were very active starting mid-January, that is no longer the case. The weather had turned against the Russians. After a warm winter, for Russia, the spring thaw had set in early. A foot of water covered the ice on the lakes. 16th Army reported that Soviet tanks were sometimes sinking up to their turrets in mud. Against a weak front, the Russians might have continued to advance, as they were doing in the Ukraine, but the Panther position, all that remained of the East Wall, was living up to German expectations and up at the extreme end of the front, I went over the Soviet terms for an armistice with Finland last week, and that the deadline 
for a final reply was set to be today, the 18th. Already the 17th, though, the Finns reject the terms, but they do say that they very much wish to explore this further. The terms are, in fact, a bit harsher than what Joseph Stalin had indicated to Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt at Tehran. The Soviets do, though, also adopt a milder tone themselves, and in a few days, will be willing to continue to talk. If you are wondering how Hitler and company feel about all this, I will go over that next week. Hitler's mind is occupied with somewhere else this week, Hungary. The operational order for the German invasion of Hungary goes out on the 12th. It is for an attack from four sides towards Budapest and emphasize the necessity of disarming the Hungarian forces and of putting down mercilessly any resistance. Unlike the original plan, the main attack was to be launched not from the south, but from the northeast. The plan contained accurate instruction concerning the conduct of the troops in Hungary and how to win over Hungarian soldiers. Furthermore, concerning the temporary suspension of oil supplies from Romania. Do the Hungarians see this coming? It seems like they can't help but notice the concentration of German troops just across the borders. But what can they do to defend? Well, they have two army corps in fighting shape, but they're pretty far off. But heck, if it took the Germans under two weeks to organize the occupation, how long can it take the Hungarians to bring them back home? There is this. Had the Hungarian government resolved to resist, it had the means to do so. The first news of a concentration of German troops arrived at the end of February, so that three weeks elapsed until the attack. During this time, the forces might have been regrouped. According to German sources, there were 350,000 men in arms at the moment in Hungary. The Germans had grave difficulty mustering the units required for the occupation. Apart from the units on the Soviet front, Hungary disposed over two armored divisions, one cavalry and nine infantry divisions, as well as two mountain brigades at the beginning of 1944. Okay, one armored, and two infantry divisions and both mountain brigades were sent to the Carpathians. But still, that leaves nine divisions at least nominally active in the country. Even without calling up any more reserves, the Hungarian army would have numerically equaled the German forces of occupation. However, the Hungarian government did nothing like that. So on March 14th, when Furch's staff met for a last conference in Vienna before invasion, the German military commanders were satisfied that the action could be speedily accomplished since the Hungarians had so far not taken any measure and because no organized resistance could be improvised. The Germans, though, do not want to do this by violence if they can avoid it. In fact, on the 15th, Hitler meets with Himmler and von Ribbentrop, and they decide to try to get Hungarian regent Miklos Horthy's consent to a military occupation. Hitler sends an invitation to Horthy to meet him at the latest the morning of the 18th. The German general staff writes a list of demands for that meeting, which basically subordinate Hungary and all Hungarian forces to Germany and German command. The meeting begins at Klesheim Castle the morning of the 18th, and, according to Horthy, Hitler talks about Italy's defection. Horthy rejects the idea of Hungary also defecting and asks if Hitler is thinking occupation. Hitler says, yeah, and Horthy gets up and leaves. Meeting again in the afternoon, Horthy still does not consent to occupation, and at 5 p.m., Hitler gives the order for Operation Margarete, the occupation of Hungary. There is a third meeting that day between Hitler and Horthy, though, and the German general staff records. Contrary to expectations, around 8 p.m., the regent went once more to the Fuhrer. In the course of this new conversation, he declared that, having completely grasped the Fuhrer's intentions, he was willing to comply with his demands. So Horthy will continue as regent, but they don't settle any other details. The invasion is scheduled to begin tonight, a few hours after midnight. Well, that's next week, but there's still other field action in Europe this week to cover. Rain fell for three solid weeks at the Monte Cassino front, where Bernard Freiburg has been waiting for three straight dry days to dry the ground enough for armor to cross, so he can begin his massive aerial bombing campaign against Casino Town, and then send in the tanks. 
Freiburg is pretty gloomy about the whole business, though, as is Sidney Kirkman, 13th Corps commander, who tells 8th Army commander Oliver Leese he thinks Operation Dickens, the whole overall operation, will not gain much, but will cost much. Well, the evening forecast, Tuesday the 14th, finally gives the good news. Dry weather, the 15th. Which means the huge bombing campaign to obliterate the town, Operation Ludlum, can begin. Planes appear over the town at 8.30 a.m. The planes carried only 1,000-pound blockbusters, with fuses set to detonate at basement depth, 0.1 seconds after impact in the nose and 0.025 in the tail. Bombardiers had no aim points other than a quarter-mile radius around Casino's heart. Medium bombers were to strike the northern hemisphere, known as A, while the heavies would hit the southern sector, B. No Luftwaffe fighters appeared. The planes are backed by 900 artillery pieces as well. The airstrike ends after three hours, but the artillery continues into the afternoon, some 200,000 shells in total. There is a big general problem, however, with accuracy. An eighth of the total bombs are either aimed at a wrong target or jettisoned, and not even half of them land within 1.5 kilometers of the center of Casino, and under a tenth land within a one kilometer radius of A or B. There is also a very serious issue with friendly fire. French General Juin's headquarters is hit, killing 15 French soldiers and wounding another 30 when a few dozen planes bomb Venafro, 16 kilometers away from Casino. The 8th Army command post there is also hit. An Indian division is bombed, a Moroccan division, and more. Almost 100 Allied soldiers are killed and maybe 250 more wounded. This is bad news. There was no recon done by flight leaders. Most of the bombers fly too high despite the lack of opposition. One plane dropping its bombs prematurely many times leads others to follow suit. There are lots of issues. Courts martial proceedings for negligence against 14 Air Force lieutenants soon begin, though all but two are eventually dropped. As for the town, well, it's wrecked but not pulverized at half of the 300 or so Germans from 1st Parachute Division who happen to be there survive in dugouts, basements, and tunnels. They are ordered to stand fast. New Zealand infantry enters the town with 350 tanks waiting behind them. But after inspecting the moonscape it now is, the engineers say that even in peacetime, it would take two days to break through to the center of town with bulldozers. By the 16th, just nine tanks are in the town, and they are soon immobilized. Still, for the rest of the week, the infantry tries to advance as three and then four battalions finally make it into town. They do take the railway station, but the defense has a huge advantage here, and the week ends with no major gains made. And with the week ending there, I will end my week here, with Soviet advances in the south, but an end to them in the north. German forces poised to invade Hungary, Japanese forces beginning an invasion of India, and Allied plans for Japan, in general, becoming more concrete. An invasion of India. Japan invaded China already in 1937, and the Japanese are still stuck there. So how will it be with India? Tough to say, because this is quite different. This is a smaller, preemptive strike, for now, anyhow, but still with an awful lot of men. And maybe Bose is right. Maybe the Indians will rise up as soon as the invasion comes and throw off British rule. Maybe. Other than China, Japan's invasions have been pretty darn successful. But here in 1944, Japan's forces are not quite what they were two, three, or, or seven years ago. But Alexander the Great invaded India, and he took a fair chunk of territory before turning back. And the Japanese Empire, I looked it up, is now larger than Alexander's greatest extent. So here, in March 1944, the results very much remain to be seen. Of course, I will be here to cover what happens 
week by week. It is thanks to the Time Ghost Army that I am able to do so. To be part of this grand adventure, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest officers, and the Army Member of the Week is Armand Massimini. That's an awesome name. And he's an awesome guy for being in the Time Ghost Army. And if you want to learn more about Japan's invasion of China in 1937, check out this Between Two Wars episode we did. It is excellent. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.